The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John, the first chapter. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who's, uh, who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Son of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which is translated, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speaking and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. After his baptism... Jesus begins to gather first disciples to himself. John the Baptist's witness is a powerful incentive for pointing people in Jesus' direction. All he has to do is say, look, here's the Lamb of God. And immediately people start leaving off following John and start following Jesus. You can almost hear John say, look, look, look and see. See the Lamb of God. See. See. Curiosity, too, is a powerful incentive. That sense of fascination and wanting to find out more. Today, two of John's disciples asked Jesus where he stays. Jesus answers, come and see. You can almost hear Jesus say, see, Andrew, see, come and see. Maybe you can see a twinkle in Jesus' eye. As he says, come on and find out for yourselves if you want to know. Well, they did come and see where he was staying and remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon, as it says. And I can't know for certain, but since it was four o'clock, apparently they hung out for a good while, maybe long into the night. I like to think that. One of the two curious followers, Simon's brother Andrew, is so impressed by Jesus, he goes home and tells his brother, he says, we've found the Christ. And this piques Peter's curiosity, Simon's curiosity. So he too has to come and see for himself. And then the next day when Simon meets Jesus, Jesus seems to recognize him. I know you, he says more or less. I know you, you're the son of John. You are to be called Cephas. Simon, Andrew, and that other disciple, they all came, they saw, and they were never the same again. Those were days of wonder and magic. Everything felt different and new. You could say that their entire world around them was reborn all around. So here are two questions. On that one specific day when Jesus attracted their attention, how many people actually did receive the invitation to come and see according to the text? Two. I heard, a, I heard the number two. That's right. 
A second question on that very same day, how many people did not come and see? And the answer is everybody else. Everybody else in the whole wide world. The entire world didn't get the invitation then, just two, but ever since, of course, Jesus' invitation to come and see, to stay where he stays, to hang out, to follow, it's been a wide open invitation. Jesus invites people in all through the course of his ministry. He tells different people to follow me, four times in Matthew and three times each in Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus invites with other words. He says, come unto me. Or, as we hear today, he says, come and see. In the case of Zacchaeus, Jesus invites himself. He looks up into the tree where Zacchaeus is hiding and says, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, I must stay at your house today. Even the last book of the Bible ends with open invitation. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let everyone who hears come. And let everyone who's thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. If the invitation is still open, and it is, then who's excluded from the guest list? And the answer is no one. That's why many churches have exterior signs that read, you are invited or all are welcome. Everyone's still invited, no one's excluded. People do self-exclude, of course. Just because you're invited doesn't mean you'll accept the invitation. So I have been thinking about those people who come and see and those who don't. The ins and the outs. The come and seers and the stay awares. There's a rather obscure Lutheran principle, but it's meaningful to me, so I'm going to talk about it a little bit. And it's a theological mouthful, so I'm going to try to make it pretty simple. It's called single predestination. Hold on. As the Protestant Reformation unfolded, and Luther's movement began to feed into other movements, Ideas around predestination happen to be a big part of the conversation. Governing documents of the ELCA affirm the Lutheran confessions written by Luther and others, and they lay out a schema for what this thing that I've called single predestination. In contrast, John Calvin and his followers worked out a scheme for double predestination, and that's the predestination that you probably are the most familiar with. It says that in God's unfolding destiny, there are only two groups, and those who truly come and th those who truly come and see, and those who don't, the baptized and the unbaptized, the ins, the outs, the elect, and the unelect. The ins are in, and the outs are out. And though humans either respond one way or another, God makes the final determination. But single predestination works out like this. There are still two groups, and the ins are in on account of baptism and the mark of the Holy Spirit on, as a sign of Christ's claim. Nothing, and no one can ever say or do anything to quash Christ's claim. As for all the rest, the inviting Christ just keeps on inviting. No matter who you are, where you are, what you are, come and see the master says. This means that the saved are definitely saved and all the rest are definitely not without hope. I really like this quote from 1 Timothy, which I'm going to paraphrase. The living God, our hope, is the savior of all those who believe, especially that. But God is also the savior of everybody else. Then too, John the Baptist declares this morning, behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. He doesn't say, behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the elect. Now, why am I telling you all this stuff? Other than, uh, I want you to understand that the invitation is open. The come and see experience is always wide open. Because in a personal way, 
And in a practical sense, the difference between the two systems involves the poise of our hearts. Whether we each individually are open or closed, accepting or judgmental, welcoming or critical, inviting or excluding, and not only toward brand new people, but also toward one another. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus' own habit is to be open and accepting of everyone and not be closed and judgmental. He sometimes has a bone to pick with his religious critics or a correction to make among the disciples, but that's about it. For me, the entire spirit and tone of the morning reading is that of being open, welcome, inviting, receiving, transforming. Rabbi, where are you staying? Well, oh, just come and see. Just you find out. As the history of Jesus' followers goes along, however, they become more and more negatively familiar and less and less forbearing. They bicker, they vie for attention and position, they get critical and judgmental and condemning, they triangulate and tattletale and talk behind each other's backs. They fight about who's greatest and hatched plots to be named Jesus' right hand or left hand person. And at the Last Supper, they wonder about who's the favorite. They also get downhearted and discouraged and maybe want to give up. On a final trek to Jerusalem, one disciple turns to the other and says, Oh, well, let's go along and die with him. The wonder and the magic and the fascination of the come and see period is all but forgotten. Gone from them is Jesus' twinkle. Especially the disciples lose track of when the whole world was new in terms of interrelationships. The gospel of invitation and welcome and conclusion and newness is apparently over, but it's not. It's not. The invitation to come and see is still an open, active, alive, eternal principle. And this makes a big difference to us because no, ma no matter how too familiar we can sometimes feel, we're still being invited into newness of relationship. Wonder and magic can still happen along with the twinkle in Jesus' eye. I know this congregation yearns for inclusion and invitation of new people from all ages and diversities. A great first step is for us to be wholly assured or reassured of our inclusion, invitation, welcome, and openness among all of us now gathered who are used to being together. To make sure there's nothing going on that would cause any separation or division or contention or strife or misunderstanding and no hint of anything like, but pastor, they rubbed me the wrong way. If you ever notice that someone is rubbing you the wrong way, turn around. They'll start rubbing you the right way and then you'll feel really good about them again. On a particular Sunday morning, the resurrection day, the disciples experienced a reset. They began to see each other and the world again, brand new as if for the very first time. On Sunday morning worship, we also can experience a reset. Confession and forgiveness is a reset. Deep forgiveness is a reset. Receiving word and meal, the entire world's reborn again and again. And we're sent back into the world to meet and to serve new people, but also to meet each other again for the very first time. And that is great good news. Amen.